Hello, good morning, everybody. Welcome to my office. My name is Vincent, and this is some Civil War poetry. Uh, this is our fifth episode, which I think is a milestone. Uh, we made it through the 4th of July weekend, which saw the Union winning the Battle of Gettysburg, as well as the siege at Vicksburg out west over Mississippi. Uh, yep, funny to say that Mississippi was definitely the West uh, considered at that point in the United States. So I think I have nobody with me, but that's okay. I know the fans are out there, and if we build it, they shall come. So I'm going to try to drink this extremely hot coffee and see how that goes for me. Still a little, a little warm, but that's okay. It's waking me up Monday morning here in Minneapolis. It's a stormy day in Minneapolis right now, um, which is fun. I always like stormy mornings. Uh, they always... I don't know. I do always like them. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to uh, go over all that and see what we got for some poetry. This is my agenda for the day. These are called bookmarks. And this is a book. Uh, all things help me. All these things help me do my job, uh, which is relate some poetry to you. Uh, so before we do that, a couple quick things, always. I uh, just wanted to point out that I have now copy and pasted the poems I'm going to feature today in the description below uh, so you can follow along. I had a fan reach out and say that they actually do that. They Google the poem to follow along. I mean, do that if that's fun for you. Uh, if not... I've, I've, I've decided to make it a little easier. Uh, so there's that. I also wanted to touch on this day in Civil War history. Go back to an old standard. A um, couple things. Seems as if July the 6th is a quiet day. Um, the most interesting thing I've got... In 1864, Union General-in-Chief Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant dispatched two brigades under Brigadier General James B. Ricketts in reaction to a raid by Lieutenant General Jubal A. Early. This led to the Battle of Monocacy on July 9th. I happen to know that's in Maryland. I happen to know nothing else about that incident. Um, maybe at a future date, we can just touch on how awesome some Civil War names are, like Ulysses or Jubal, Jubal A. Early. That's pretty cool. Uh, this website also features a U.S. Civil War quote. I think this one is maybe a little bit more interesting than the date. Um, oh, no, it changed on me. Well, this is a different one. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. U.S. President Lincoln in his inauguration address on March 4th, 1861. So that's not today. That's not a this quote in history, this quote on this day in history. That's just a quote from history. Cool. Uh, with those two things out of the way, we'll move on to our other feature, which I kind of like this. We're going to read the short bios of the authors we featured on the previous uh, show, which was Friday morning, and we read a poem by Ethel. That's not true. We read uh, a union poem by Charles Dawson Shanley. And he was born in 1811, died in 1875. He was born and educated in Dublin, Ireland. An Irishman wouldn't you know? I will. Oh, man. I wanted to read the rest of this in that Irish dialect. I'm going to fight that bit better in that impulse, but you know it was there. So maybe you can close your eyes and, and follow along. Uh, as a young man, he emigrated to Canada and held a position there in the civil service. His brother Walter was a confident was a confidant of the first Canadian Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. 
By 1860, Shangley had moved to New York, where he found work as a contributor of essays, poetry, and sketches to a variety of popular magazines and newspapers. All right. Not bad, Mr. Shangley. The second poem, an author we featured uh, last week, was by a fellow named Alexander B. Meek. He was a Confederate poet. He was born in 1814 and died in 1865. He was born in... Just calling it... I wonder if he died in the war. Was born in Columbia, South Carolina. As a young man, he participated in the Second Seminole War. As the close... At the close of the campaign, he was appointed Attorney General of Alabama, the first of several public positions. Although a prolific writer, most of Meek's books, including Songs and Poems of the South, 1857, and Romantic Passages in Southwestern History, 1857, were composed during his final decade. So nothing on how he died there. I'm just going to do a quick Google search. Alexander B. Meek. Poet. Do, 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 do. Go to the Wikipedia article. First one that popped up. And nothing. He was a chess player. Served as Alabama's attorney general. What a mystery. How did he die? Okay, okay. This is a longer article from auburn.education. That should be promising. Nope. In, okay, he, in 1864, he married... His brother's mother-in-law. That's interesting. Meek lived little more than a year after his marriage, dying on November 1st, 1865, which was after the war. Okay, so that just answers that he didn't die in the war. But it doesn't answer how he died, except that he married his brother's mother-in-law. Are they connected? Leave your comments and thoughts below. I don't know if he has any other poems in the book. Maybe we'll get to them. In the meantime, I will read what we have today. Ah, so again, my famous spiel. Uh, this is poetry of the Civil War. Uh, it features a multitude of poems by the Blue, meaning the Union Federal Forces, and a, and a bunch of poems from the Gray, meaning the Confederate uh, Rebel Forces. So each morning I feature one of each just to gain some insight into the time um, because these were, this isn't just someone else dictating history. This is primary source documents essentially. Uh, so I think it's really fascinating to see how the early poems have been super romantic in their notion of war. We're going off to war, hurrah, hurrah. And then uh, as we've seen peppered in a little bit is, oh my God, war sucks. My leg's gone. Please God, I want to see my mama. Not to bring it down too much, but, you know, it's uh, war as hell. Who said it? Comment below. Okay, the first poem is by Emily Dickinson. Yes. When I was, a, when I was small, a woman died. When I was small, a woman died. Today, her only boy went up from the Potomac, his face all victory. To look at her, how slowly the seasons must have turned till bullets clipped an angle and he passed quickly round. If pride shall be in paradise, I never can decide. Of their imperial conduct, no person testified. But proud in apparition, that woman and her boy pass back and forth before my brain as ever in the sky. I always love Emily Dickinson. I even if I don't quite understand what I just read, but I, I, I want to read it again. When I was small, a woman died. Today, her only boy went up from the Potomac, his face all victory. 
to look at her, how slowly the seasons must have turned till bullets clipped an angle and he passed quickly round. If pride shall be in paradise, I never can decide. Of their imperial conduct, no person testified. But proud in apparition, that woman and her boy pass back and forth before my brain as ever in the sky. Okay, I get it now. So when she was young, a woman died. And then, say, 18 years later, the seasons have turned... But, but her boy eventually grew up to die as well. I really like the line, but proud in apparition, that woman and her boy pass back and forth before my brain. Are they ghosts? Or are they just like visions in her head? Comment below. That was great. That was Emily Dickinson. When I was small, a woman died. Uh, before I read the second one, just again, one a little disclaimer. I am not an expert. I have a degree in theater, not, you know, English or literature or history. But all this stuff, uh, I think, is really cool, but also very important uh, to maybe understanding current events, just connecting dots. History doesn't necessarily repeat, but it can rhyme. And I, I think that's a cool way to think about it. So the second poem is from The Grey. It is called Charleston. Guess who it's by? Our old friend Henry Timrod. Timrod, Timrod. Um, we featured a couple episodes ago. So this is Charleston. Calm as that second summer which precedes the first fall of the snow. In the broad sunlight of heroic deeds, the city bides the foe. As yet, behind their ramparts, stern and proud, her bolted thunders sleep. Dark sumter, like a battlement cloud, looms o'er the solemn deep. No calp frowns from lofty cliff or scar to guard the holy strand. But Moultrie holds in leash her dogs of war above the level sand. And down the dunes a thousand guns lie couched, unseen beside the flood, like tigers in some orient jungle crouched that wait and watch for blood. Meanwhile, through streets still echoing with trade, walk grave and thoughtful men, whose hands may one day wield the patriot's blade as lightly as the pen. And maidens, with such eyes as would grow dim over a bleeding hound, seem each one to have caught the strength of him whose sword she sadly bound. Thus, girt without and garrisoned at home, day patient following day, old Charleston looks from roof and spire and dome across her tranquil bay. Ships through a hundred foes from Saxon lands and spicy Indian ports. Bring Saxon steel and iron to her hands and summer to her courts. But still, along yon dim Atlantic line, the only hostile smoke creeps like a harmless mist above the brine from some frail floating oak. Shall the spring dawn, and she still clad in smiles and with an unscathed brow, rest in the strong arms of her palm-crowned isles as fair and free as now? We know not. In the temple of the fates, God has, has inscribed her doom, and all, untroubled in her faith, she waits the triumph or the tomb. Wow. I don't need to read that one again. <laughs> uh, I, I like that. I, I think it super descriptive of a city on edge sort of on the brink not only of war but in their minds on the brink of revolution um you know what if that was a poem about charleston in 1776 you wouldn't know the difference you know what war they were talking about which i find really fascinating um before i wrap up here in a couple minutes uh that just made me think about the one time I did go to Charleston and I did not get the Fort Sumter. 
alas, didn't, uh, it was closed by the time I got there after five. So next time. Uh, also, um, I started rewatching Gone with the Wind last week, just based on, you know, everything that's going on and just wanted to see it from sort of an objective point of view. And I won't get into the, you know, all the problems with it. Uh, but I will just make an observation that much like reading the poem Charleston, it was really interesting to see a point, a Southern point of view from the home front. Like when Atlanta's burning in Gone with the Wind and everyone's just like, the Yankees are coming and they're burning everything and everyone's dying. And, you know, doctors can't be found. It's like, you know, it's still an American city. So you're like, okay, is this the civil war or, or maybe this is the revolution revolution? You don't know. I mean, if you were to just look at it blindly, but um, yeah. So again, my name is Vincent. This is some civil war poetry. I'll be back this time tomorrow, 730 for six. And we'll see what we go, go over then. Take care, everybody.